<laughs> Thanks very much for coming. Um, for those of you I may not have met already, my name is Ed Downey, and on behalf of the Northeast Historical Society, thanks very much for, for coming this evening. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, first of all, there's some snacks and water outside, so feel free to help yourselves anytime to have that. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, the restrooms in the facility, just, just as you come in this door into this space, if you were to go out and take a sharp right, it's down a hallway and there are two two bathrooms there on the left. Obviously, there's a fire exit um, where you came in. There's also one here. Five years ago, next Thursday, Millerton American Legion Post 178 and the Northeast Historical Society joined forces to present a program on World War I and its impact on our community. That's the first time we had the opportunity to work with the Legion's gifted historian, Sean Clay, and it was a wonderful experience. We're delighted that Sean has agreed to share with us his research on another important accomplishment of our community's veterans. I knew that since 1927, the American Legion Post 178, founded by World War I veterans, had been an important part of our community. What I did not know until I saw this book this is last year's Dutchess County Historical Society yearbook, and Sean Clay's article in there told me that there was a post before that uh, that was founded by veterans of the Civil War. So that's what this program is going to be about this evening. Sean is going to tell us the story of that. Sean is a Dutchess County native He's a, who's earned a BA in history from Westfield State College is completing his master's in military history from the American Military University. Major Clay has served in the United States Army for 22 years with deployments to both Europe and Afghanistan. Sean, thank you very much for your service and for agreeing to share with us your local history research on the GAR post. Assuming you've got me turned on. All right, so good evening, everybody. Uh, I have to admit, I'm a little pleasantly surprised with the turnout. I figured there might be crickets and maybe one or two people out there. I'd, uh, I'd be talking more to my wife tonight than all of you five people, so thank you. Um, so this all started with a question that was posed to me uh, roughly 14, 15 years ago um, at a Legion meeting when. One of the members asked me, well, when did we actually start having Memorial Day? You know, we were looking to, at that point, kind of continue flushing out, revamping the Memorial Day program a little bit, and it was like, you know, we want to add some more depth to it, so when did it start? And that turned out not to be exactly a very easy answer to dig into. Um, and then I started, you know, found couple websites and start digging through the old newspaper archives and I'm like hey what's uh, what the heck is this organization called the GAR and of course they weren't exactly helpful in spelling out what GAR meant so you had to go track that down well eventually long story short I learned that the GAR referred to the Grand Army of the Republic well what is the Grand Army of the Republic and one research question kept turning into another and over the course of about a little over a decade started uncovering this story and and I finally got to the point where it's like, all right, I need to kind of start organizing this and actually start writing something up. And next thing I know, I've written almost 20,000 words. And I'm like, OK, this is a little bit too big because no one's going to publish 20,000 words. Uh, and then, you know, talking with the local historical society here in town and the county historical society and uncovering some more, uh, kind of ended up revamping it. And, you know, the first of what's going to be a series of articles is what what came out last year. So. The presentation tonight is going to focus mostly on the post. It's going to touch on some of the other subject areas, and I'll kind of allude to that as we get there. So, but at the end of the day, what is the big takeaway of tonight is that at the end of the day, as, uh, as others have said before me, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, uh, you know, especially in, uh, for those of us who have been in the service or still are in the service and or, you know, these veterans organizations. 
And that is very, very true of our local Legion post uh, in the fact that we stand on the shoulders of some very impressive giants and some of the things that they did. Uh, and interestingly enough, as I started kind of learning more about even the history of, of the Legion post, um, just how much we actually carried forward that we don't necessarily do totally today, but uh, that we did do for quite a while. So the first question I want to answer for you tonight is, who is Henry Gridley? Well, the short version is, and I can't dawdle on this too much, is Henry Gridley was an Amini native, South Amini to be specific. Um, his family had some very significant interest, uh, business interests throughout the Harlem Valley. Uh, he was himself born in 1836, uh, and his parents uh, very well to do. All right, He ends up going to college, Amherst College, in 1858. Um, and when the Civil War breaks out in 1861, in the spring of 1861, he immediately wants to quit school and go to war. Um, his family, his friends, and his professors all lean on him pretty significantly to not do that, to actually stay the course, finish his degree, which he subsequently does the following spring of 1862. Now, what also happens in the spring of 1862 is, at this point, we're just over a year in, George McClellan is now the ar commander of the Army of the Potomac, and actually the commander-in-chief of all the Union forces, and he launches what becomes known as the Peninsula Campaign. Uh, so the Union Army lands at Fortress Monroe, starts mo marching north and east, uh, excuse me, north and west towards Richmond, and the Confederate Army, then under the command of General Joseph Johnson, starts coming down the peninsula to oppose them. They have these series of battles and everything else. And finally, the Union Army finds itself encamped just outside of Richmond, where they can literally hear the church bells on Sunday morning. That then begins a series of what becomes known as the Seven Days Battles in late May, which ultimately ends up having General Johnson, the Confederate commander, shot. Uh, he's wounded in battle, ends up getting relieved, and President Jefferson Davis ends up appointing Robert E. Lee, who then ultimately becomes the commander of what is redesignated the Army of Northern Virginia. That series of battles triggers for the North the third major call-up of units into the Union Army. So the first one happens after uh, Fort Sumter. The second one happens after... Uh, the defeat at Bull Run, the third one now calls up this. So you have most of your units in the, in here in New York anyway, in the triple digits, that's where those buckety units now enters into the Union Army, the 150th being one of them. Young Henry here decides, hey, listen, I'm, I don't care. I'm now going in. So he ends up getting appointed ultimately uh, eight companies as, as the first lieutenant of that company, so effectively kind of like the executive officer for the unit, but not quite true, uh, and ends up heavily recruiting for that unit, mostly Amenia, but also pieces of Millbrook, Stanfordville, Northeast, so on and so forth. And actually a lot of the veterans from the town of Northeast actually end up going into uh, Company D, but also other units throughout the 150th. But at this point also, there have been also other members of the community who have also previously enlisted, uh, especially during the early 1861 days. However, the 150th, they come, they see combat for the first time, most famously on July 2nd, 1862, at Gettysburg, is their first taste of combat. That evening, uh, one of the cannon batteries that was part of Sickles' Third Corps, they had, he had foolishly gone forward gets himself in a whole bunch of trouble in a place now known as the wheat field and the peach orchard and devil's den. And this battery of artillery ends up doing a fighting withdrawal. They lose all their horses, so they can't withdraw the guns. And they, the cannons get overrun and the cannons get left behind. Well, the Confederates can't get them either because there's no horses. They don't have any horses to pull them. So the 150th with its brigade that it's attached to ends up going forward, and that's the first time that they actually see combat at Turfrey's Farm. Anyway, following the Battle of Gettysburg, um, 12th Corps, which, would, which is, it was assigned to, is merged with 11th Corps, gets redesignated the 20th Corps. General Joe Hooker, who had previously been the Army of the Potomac commander, now becomes the Corps commander, and they get sent west. Um, they were kind of 
the, the 11th and 12th Corps were kind of referred to as the misfit children of the Army of the Potomac. Didn't really integrate well, didn't play well with others, so to speak, so they sent them west. Uh, they end up linking up with General Grant outside of Chattanooga, help relieve Chattanooga, take part in the battles of Missionary Ridge, Lookout Mountain, all those fun places down there. And then beginning in the spring of 1864, after Lincoln appoints Grant as the overall commander in chief and promotes him to three stars, General Sherman now takes this army group and they start the Atlanta campaign about the same time that um, Grant begins the Overland campaign in, uh, in May of 1864. So they now fight a series of battles, Resaca, New Hope Church, Lost Mountain. And then finally we get to where the armies are now staged outside of Kennesaw Mountain, Georgia, which is just outside of Marietta. Now, this is where the sources get kind of fun. So the action that proceeds, it's a prelude action to the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain. Kennesaw Mountain is off the map to the north, is Kolb's Farm. And basically what this was, was a fight between a couple divisions that decide to slug it out. The Confederates are the assaulting element here. They attack. The Union troops had just gotten into position they're like, hey, we got to dig in. And at this point, that be had become standard practice, all right? So these images of troops standing up in the middle of a field slugging it out isn't really realistic by this point of the war. They stop, they dig in. That's what they're doing. The Confederates assault. Um, they start returning fire. They're on a nice slope looking downhill at the advancing Confederates. Lieutenant Gridley is now the company commander for A Company. And he, talk, he turns to one of his soldiers, who's an excellent shot, and tells him, hey, shoot the Confederate color bearer. He brings him down, and then literally a split second later, bullet comes in and unfortunately kills Lieutenant Henry when he takes a, uh, a bullet through the heart. So he ends up being buried there locally in Georgia initially. Ultimately, his family will, after the war, disinter the remains and bring him back home. And he's re uh, repatriated to South Armenia, and he's now as his final resting place in, South, in the South Armenia Cemetery. Um, interestingly enough, the, and you can, for the, anybody who spent any significant time down south, you can understand how locally it's Kolb's Farm, K-O-L-B. However, if you look at a lot of the records and sources from the 150th, to include their monument in Gettysburg, they spell it as Kolb's Farm, not Kolb's Farm. So you can understand how there would be a little bit of a dialect issue there. Anyway, so on a, on a past trip my, that I had myself to Kennesaw Mountain Battlefield, this is not the exact spot, this is, but this is roughly the vicinity of the spot where uh, Lieutenant uh, Gridley was killed. Uh, and then actually, unfortunately, you probably can't see it too well, uh, but the, the Kolb's Farm farmhouse is still a private residence today on the battlefield uh, and uh, is right there, um, right by the parking area. Beautiful spot by any chance if you ever get a chance to go down and visit that part of Georgia. Anyway, so next question, what is the Grand Army of the Republic? Essentially, to put it simply, it's a lot like the, it serves a very much the same, similar functions that the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign Wars and the American Legion serve today. Uh, so we are patriotic veterans service organizations, uh, basically built around the model of the local post that's in the local communities where local veterans get together and uh, have camaraderie, do community events, so on and so forth. Um, five of the significant post-war, uh, post-1865, that is, presidents, to include Grant, uh, Garfield, and so forth, were actually members of the GAR. Uh, Sherman was also, uh, Sheridan, all the, all the big names. They all end up becoming members of the GAR. Um, in terms of veterans organizations, this is not the first veterans organization uh, in American history. The first one actually is, becomes known as the Society of the Cincinnati. Uh, they were composed of the officers of the Continental Army following the American Revolution. So it was very exclusive in that, resent, in that sense. Uh, the same thing happens after the Civil War. There is the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States. Again, an officers only club, okay? Um, but the GAR, the vision for this was, it, it, it's the first one that I believe anyway, based on my research, that is all-inclusive of anybody who wore the uniform, regardless of service, regardless of rank. So that's its first kind of claim to fame. But its second claim to fame, it is also the first organization in the history of the United States that's also racially integrated, okay? Now, there were some posts that were exclusively white, other posts that were exclusively black, 
But there was also a fair number of posts that were also, you know, didn't matter. You wore the uniform, you were welcome to the party. Um, so it does have that distinction uh, as well. The organization itself uh, mimicked and was structured around what they were familiar with, which was the Army organization. Uh, so pre-war, pre-1861 that is, your ranking officer in the United States Army was actually known as the Adjutant General, okay? Um, hence, so they carry that term into the Grand Army of the Republic. So the national commander is known as the Adjutant General. At the state level organization, the commander was known as the Assistant Adjutant General for that department. So what we would refer to in the service today as areas of operation. So a specific unit is given a specific area, you know, basically their own sandbox to play in uh, on the map. They carry that term over. So the states now become the departments that they organize themselves around. So New York becomes the department in New York. Interestingly enough, the American Legion also carries that. And I also believe the VFW, Brian, right, also uses the same terminology. So the states are the departments, okay? And then the local organization, just like the Legion and the VFW today, are also organized around the post. Now, there are some informal other organizations that come out of play, and we'll talk about that here shortly, um, where there was a county association, but it wasn't necessarily formally part of the organization. For, Dutch, for the Dutchess County Post, the same thing. Uh, there's also a, an interesting tri-state one that comes out uh, that gets birth shortly after the founding of the Millerton Post. Now, the posts in Dutchess County, interestingly enough, are either con consolidated along the Hudson River or consolidated along the Harlem Valley. Why that is, I don't know, but that's just the way it worked out. Um, seven of these posts pretty much run the course. Uh, you know, a lot of them are founded between the 1870s, 1880s, uh, and a lot of them will, the seven of them at least, uh, will make it to the 1920s very early on, and then they rapidly start fading out at that point. Uh, Couple of the Poughkeepsie posts split, merge, you know, disassociate. There's some friction in Poughkeepsie. Won't get into that. Um, but interestingly, Henry Gridley post of Millerton is founded in 1887. So this is the ninth post established in Dutchess County. The last post established in Dutchess County will be in 1898 in Amenia. Um, most of these names will are officers from the 150th, not all of them. For instance, the Armstrong post over in Rhinebeck is actually named after a significant member of the community from the Revolutionary War era. So, but most of them, even John Ketchum, he was the regimental commander of the 150th, and actually, as a side fact there, actually gets elected to Congress in 1864 during the, that uh, election cycle. Uh, so it's actually, actually kind of cool reading all the soldiers' letters as they're actually campaigning from Georgia hey, vote for John Ketchum, vote for John Ketchum during, during the course of the campaign. So they uh, basically, in the summer of July of 1887, they apply for their charter. Uh, they sent it to the department co uh, commander, AKA the assistant adjutant general of New York, and basically it gets approved. So they have their first organizational meeting on September 9th, 1887. Also, what's really interesting, and it doesn't show up well on the next picture, but the diversity of the units represented here, I thought, was also kind of interesting. It's not wholeheartedly made up of members of the 150th. Now, a lot of members of the 150th will join the Millerton Post, uh, specifically from companies DNA. But you, you have the 60th, you have the 91st. Now, those are your 1861 regiments. Uh, and then, of course, you have a lot of cross-pollination across that, those state lines of Massachusetts and, and Connecticut as well, which is also very interesting. And then we did have some members from the community uh, from the 5th New York, which is also one of those early 1861 units as well. So this is our first slate of officers. I'm not going to dawdle on this too much. You can see these are the charter members of the post here. Um, and, uh, you know, these names are, are kind of all, it's interesting reading, you know, how often they end up turning up in the newspaper sources of the day. What I thought was really interesting is that the, uh, the initial meetings uh, in 1887, 1888 were in the uh, Masonic Lodge here in Millerton. Um, rent was $50 a year. Now, we don't necessarily think of $50 a year being all that significant. Well, that's $1,600 today when you account for inflation. 
post dues were three dollars that's ninety six dollars today so um so i think bob and brian for anybody who wants to complain about our post dues going forward all we have to do is to, yeah these guys paid more the known post members now from what i was able to track down out of the newspapers as i was doing my research um i was able to find at least identify positively 47 of them so uh, the first 31 are here. A couple interesting names pop up. Joseph McGee, he's going to be popping up in our story here in a little bit again. Um, and, uh, you know, heavily, heavily on the 150th, but also the, you know, heavily out of the 128th, which was the Columbia Duchess Regiment as well, which also was mustering at the same time. Um, Ward Van de Bogart, he ends up becoming the last commander of the post. And he'll be uh, playing part in our story. Peter Welsh will be, part, be uh, playing part of our story as well. Um, so the way I'm going to tell this story, uh, and I, I kind of had to go back and forth about how I was going to do this, is that I could tell it chronologically. I could just go year by year and give you a brief summary. Uh, unfortunately, my primary sources, and I'll get into why this is a little bit later, I was really limited to the local newspapers of the day. And of course, those records are not exactly complete. So what I decided to do is I'm going to tell this as it, a typical year, so to speak, a 12-month 12, 12 year of the way the post would have operated, but then tell you the stories, and they're going to be hot scotched all over the place in terms of uh, the year that they actually happened. So the first thing that would happen in the course of the GAR typical year was the New Year's Ball. All right, so there's a theme that's going to come up tonight repeatedly. Apparently, us veterans, we like food, we like dancing, and we like entertainment, particularly cards, okay? That happens quite frequently. So, New Year's Ball, Barton Hall, all right? So, the old Brick Block Hotel, a.k.a. Brick Block Auto Parts, the upper level. Uh, Ed, I'm not sure if that's the same building. I'm pretty sure it's not. No, it's not. But the building that was once upon a time there on that location apparently had a very fabulous hall. It was used multiple times by the GAR. Um, but the other thing that, ha uh, that happened in January was the installation of officers. So kind of works similar for the VFW and the Legion today. Elections are one month. The subsequent month is typically the, when the officers are officially sworn in for their one-year, 12-month term. Well, the same thing happened in the GAR. So their officer installations took place in January. And uh, typically how those would work is that an officer from another post would actually come in and do the swearing in, okay? And there would usually typically be some sort of talk uh, that they would um, you know, share some, pre, uh, some war experiences, share some stories. And then in the early years, they would actually retire afterwards to the commander's home and the commander's wife and some of the other spouses of the other members would actually have a full course dinner ready for them to go. Later on, and I'll get this into the next slide, uh, there would be a akin to the Legion Auxiliary organization that was formed and then they would actually uh, provide that function for the installation and actually have a dinner on site for them. So speaking of the, uh, the ladies' uh, organization, so in 1906, um, a woman by the name of Kate Glendhill out of Albany comes down uh, at the request of the local wives to help them establish what becomes known as the Women's Relief Corps 116 of the Henry Gridley Post of the Grand Army of the Republic. So this really Long name gets shortened basically down just Women's Relief Corps. Um, a lot of the posts in Dutchess County actually had this organization. And um, from what I was able to figure out, the idea of the Legion Auxiliary and the VFW Auxiliary actually comes out of this. Okay, um, They very quickly become a very interesting aspect uh, and complementary organization to the, to the organization. So yes, it took them 19 years to, to get established, but they hit the ground running pretty good. The uh, uh, a Mrs. Phoebe Corey, which was uh, the wife of post member Charles Corey, actually becomes the organization's first president. And, uh, and they actually have hold their initial meetings for many years in the international or was the IOF, the International Organization of Oddfellows, if I remember correctly. 
Um, so that's where they, uh, they kind of call home. Uh, so the first president was a Phoebe Corey. The senior vice president was a Jesse Hogue. Uh, junior vice president was an Agnes Gleason. Uh, treasurer, Henrietta Puff. So in addition to being the first treasurer and the charter member, she's also one, she's still, she's still there in the 1920s when the, when the Women's Relief Corps uh, finally folds. Uh, Fanny Morgan was the secretary, chaplain was Grace Klein, conductor was Nellie Wilkinson, uh, and they had the color, and they had multiple color bearers and a few other officers to, to begin with. Um, they did not do this all too late, and you'll find out why in just a second. The next uh, big significant event on the social calendar was, of course, Lincoln's birthday. Uh, Lincoln's birthday, again, another occasion for guest speakers, dinner, food, and good comradeship. Um, and then on February 22nd, Washington's birthday uh, becomes, oh, actually, hang on. There's, I, I am about to neglect a really entertaining and humorous story. So backing up to Lincoln's birthday here for just a second. One of the keynote speakers in 1913 is a guy by the name of Henry, Henry W. Knight. All right, and he shares his personal recollections of President Lincoln. I'm not going to recite the entire story, but basically the gist of it is this. Uh, Mr. Knight was wounded at the battle during the Battle of Chancellorsville. He ends up recuperating in Washington, D.C. Afterwards, he doesn't get sent back to his unit. He actually gets sent to be an orderly in the War Department. Now, in those days, the war, you know, we didn't have the Department of Defense like we do today. The War Department, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Secretary of the Navy, they all had their offices almost immediately, or like literally across the street from the White House. Okay. And they all had their own buildings and so on and so forth. So he gets to be an orderly, okay? And so he's where they're working the night shift, and President Lincoln pops in. He goes upstairs to the telegraph office and is you know there till the wee hours of the morning reading dispatches. Secretary Stan, then the Secretary of War comes in, he does the same thing, and then shortly after, two o'clock or so in the morning, President Lincoln walks back to the executive mansion. Well, after that, Secretary Stanton goes, hey, from this point forth, you're no longer going to let the President walk back by himself in the middle of the night. Now, this is before the days of the Secret Service or anything like that. So the next night, same thing happens. President Lincoln comes in about midnight, goes upstairs, starts reading dispatches. About 2 a.m., he comes back downstairs, and now Sergeant Knight says, all right, you know, detail. Let's fall in. Let's escort the president. The president goes, hang on, i got to get to this part of the text because this is kind of funny. At least to me it is. He goes, uh, uh, what does that mean? The president, that is. He goes, well, sir, we're, we're going to escort you home. Mr. President goes, I don't want an escort. Mr. President, said the sergeant, I have been ordered by Mr. Stanton to escort you, and I dare not disobey his orders. Mr. Lincoln, are, am I not your superior officer? Yes, Mr. President. Am I not the commander-in-chief of the Army Navy of the United States? Yes, Mr. President. Then I hereby order you to dismiss the escort, for I will have no escort. The president then makes his way to the door, and upon touching it and turning around, he goes, you know what, sergeant, on reflection, I'm going to accept this escort because to disobey the Secretary of War, he can be a bit of an ornery fellow, and he's probably going to have you court-martialed and shot. So thereafter, the president always had his escort. So now, bouncing back to uh, February 22nd, Washington's birthday becomes the anniversary of what becomes known as the Tri-State Reunion. Uh, so we'll touch on this uh, in a little bit, but in August was typically clam bake season here in Millerton. Out of that, some of the other posts from across the border in Connecticut, they start, you know, they come across over to support their comrades here in Millerton, and they have this idea for this reunion, since there is some, a lot of cross-border pollination here in the tri-state. Um, so they decide to have these reunions. They decide to have it on the anniversary of February 22nd, uh, which is Washington's birthday. These become very big. One of the years, and forgive me, I, I don't remember exactly which one, there was 3,000 people descended on the, on, the, on the village of Millerton for one of these reunions at one point. Okay, so needless to say, the hotels and the houses and everything, everybody was quite strapped. But there was the women's auxiliary there, and they were successfully able to feed all 3,000 people, all right, which was pretty cool. The very first reunion was actually hosted by the Millerton Post. So this would have been uh, 1891 when that went down. 
All right, these are the charter members of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Women's Relief Corps, number 116. There was 22 of them. And uh, moving on. Not much would happen in March, apparently. So we're going to skip March. We're going to go right to April. So 1891, you'll see this year pop up quite a bit, was the 25th anniversary of the founding of the GAR from the initial post that was uh, founded in Aurora, Illinois. Um, this turned into a pretty big deal. Again, this was another event that was held in Barton Hall. Um, and uh, another night of singing, which was another prominent feature of these events, as well as... Uh, um, uh, a brief message from one of the local pastors and then a couple keynote speakers that they had for this event. So, uh, and this happened nationally. This wasn't just a Millerton event. This was actually a national event that happened through all these GAR posts all the way through the United States where they existed. Decoration Day, the most important day on the GAR's calendar. Uh, and I think the reason for that is pretty obvious. Uh, so as I've shared uh, during the Memorial Day programs for many years now, the uh, original order was uh, the Grand Army of the Republic Order, General Order Number 11, uh, issued in 1898, becomes the foundation for the nationalization of Memorial Day, okay? Uh, the first known event that I was able to uncover for here in Millerton is May of 1888. Um, their procedures... Basically, they began at sunrise. They would go to the graves of all the veterans that they then knew. They had worked, started working on the graves registration, locating all the, everybody who served. So here in the town of Northeast, we have graves that go back to the colonial period, so the French and Indian War. Um, so Northeast Center, Spencer's Corner, and Coleman Station. All right, so that's where the oldest graves are in our community of our war dead. Um, so they began at sunrise. They didn't decorate with flags. They actually decorated with flowers. There was another detail that would then go down all the way to South Amenia, and there was a whole procession as part of this. They had young ladies all dressed up in elegant white dresses with sashes with the, with the names of the 13 original states. I mean, it was, a, it was a big deal. They had a couple ministers go down, had a whole color party, firing party, so on and so forth. And they actually went and did a service annually at the graveside of Henry Gridley, um, who the post is, of course, named after. After all these early morning tributes were done, they'd all come back, and then they would have a parade from the post headquarters, uh, which varied over the course of the years, uh, to Irondale Cemetery, to what we now know as the old veterans plot, okay? And that's where a lot of our Civil War guys are buried. And they would have uh, a graveside service there, just as we do today for our militant parade. And beginning in 1903, the Millerton Cornet Band, which pops up repeatedly also throughout the course of the story, uh, joins them in 1903 to provide the marching music and so on and so forth. They also start, and this is another tradition that the Legion will pick up uh, in 1927, um, what, the, what was referred to as Memorial Sunday. So this was typically the Sunday after Memorial Day. So Memorial Day for many years was fixed on, March, uh, on May 30th. The Sunday following, they would actually have a church service. So that would bounce between the local churches here in Millerton and the pastor would give a speech. There would be hymns sung. They would remember the guys who had passed so was, since the previous year, so on and so forth. And, uh, and this, is, this is another one of those traditions that the Legion will continue after, uh, after it begins in 1927. June 1891, like I said, this is a year that pops up quite a bit, um, is the dedication of the Salisbury Civil War Monument, which many of us know right there by the White Hart. Um, fun story about this one, uh, Joseph McGee, McGee Hill's named after him, right? He was in Delta Company of the 150th New York. Now, at the end of the war, he buys from the army one of the regimental mules, brings it home. That mule's still here in 1891. So he literally hitches it to a wagon, brings it down off the mountain into the Millerton, Bunch of guys hop in his wagon, and they all ride. They actually join up with a band coming down from Ankrum, and they all march all the way over to Salisbury, take part of the dedication, and then they, you know, hitch back up, and they come all the way back later that day. Um, but to see the story in print and actually read through it is actually kind of entertaining. Um, afterwards, uh, the other big event that would happen on the, on the calendar in June was a Women's Relief Corps event that becomes known as the Annual. 
So this is a, a three night event where there was an entertainment night, which had a variety of activities that would take place, a card night event, which apparently was exceptionally popular. And then of course, it's not a GAR event without some sort of dance. Um, so that becomes one of the primary fundraising mechanisms for the Women's Relief Corps. There's another one later in the year that unfortunately we don't have time to get into, but this is the first of the, the two big events that the Women's Relief Corps has annually. Gettysburg. So 1913 is the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, this is ultimately going to be another article that down the road I hope to write and hope to share the story from a more of a county-centric uh, viewpoint. Ultimately, there's seven posts and 139 veterans from Dutchess County alone that end up going to Gettysburg. So what I understand how this went down is that the Department of War, which is what the Army fell under back in the, back in the days before the Department of Defense, actually paid for special trains coming from all over the United States to bring all these veterans to Gettysburg for the 50th anniversary. So all these guys from Dutchess and all these guys from Ulster County all meet in Highland Falls for this special, train, special express train on a Monday morning to go down to Gettysburg. The Army had built an entire encampment. It was basically a city on the battlefield, literally, um, for these guys to, you know, with washing stations and latrines and tents and places to eat and all sorts of stuff. And they all descend down on there. Um, what I thought was interesting about this is that out of Millerton, you've got 19 members from this community who actually traveled down there for that event, which is actually the third largest contingent out of Dutchess County. Um, the largest being, of course, out of Poughkeepsie. They had sent 69 guys, and then Beacon sends uh, a, a respectable 17. Um, and so it, it just, it's, it's just, to me, it really kind of strikes me as being a, a, a pretty cool event. And of course, you know, we've got the, the famous picture of all these guys and their spouses in front of the monument itself. And of course, there's the monument today. As I mentioned earlier, August is clam bake season. Seems to be a popular thing here in Millerton. Um, this was another annual fundraiser that they had. Uh, this begins in August of 1889. And continues for many, many years afterwards. All right, so the old nickel plate rink, which I do remember popping up in a previous uh, Historical Society discussion, uh, was the first place it was held. Uh, and of course, it's out of the 1889, or excuse me, the 1890 clan bake event that the idea for the tri-state reunion in February comes to life. Um, this, by the way, is the only picture I have been able to find of a Civil War veteran from the Millerton Post, uh, and if you look carefully uh, on his uh, kepi, uh, he's actually got the GAR insignia pinned on to it. September was typically the time of year where the, the County Veterans Association would get together. Now, this starts exclusively as a GAR thing. But what I thought was really interesting is that, and this starts coming up in the 1910, 1911, 1912 papers, is that they open it up because since at that, by that point, we've already had another war, and that's the Spanish-American War in 1888, 18, uh, 18, uh, 18, 90, 98, 1899. Um, it is out of that war that you birth the VFW. Okay, the veterans of foreign wars, which is still around today. But what these guys do is they open up this veterans association. Since this is not a, an actual function of the GAR, they open it up to everybody. So any veteran in Dutchess County is able to take part in these meetings, um, which I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, but also what's interesting is this is also the time of year where the county begins the process of assessing the disbursements to the posts for veterans relief. Now, yes, the fundraising they were doing, yeah, they were paying their rent, they were doing those things, but there's also other things that the, that the GAR posts do. And one of the most important things they did, and, and this is in the day before we have the, all the, all the three, double, three letter agencies that come out of the, the New Deal and the, and the Great Society uh, Acts of the 1960s, is 
it was your community organizations that actually handled things like taking care of widows and orphans and stuff like that. Okay, that was the functions that your churches and your civic organizations did. That's what the county, excuse me, was using the GAR to do in on terms of the veterans. Okay. Um, so if you look here, the Rhinebeck post gets $400. Well, if counting for inflation, that's 12,500 today. Uh, the Amenia post, the Millerton post, the Beacon post all get 500 a piece. Uh, that's 15,600 and change today. All right. So these were, you know, some pretty significant, uh, dispersals of money that come out of the county taxpayers that they entrusted to the organizations like the GAR to make sure that they were going to and being used for the right reasons. Um, one of the things that comes up over and over and over and over again, and this will come up in a, in a following slide, actually it might be the, no, it's not the next one, um, is a phrase that you see repeatedly is that the deceased left their spouse and their children destitute. All right, so this is so this is what that money is going toward. Okay. Um, October, November, we have the post inspections, um, and basically what would happen here is that a representative from the department would come down, uh, and he would be assigned to a particular region of the state, and he would just make his way around the, around his region to inspect the records of the post. So where the membership role is good to go, where the financial bookkeeping kept it, you know, the books kept up, uh, so on and so forth. Were they doing what they're supposed to do in terms of civic engagement and things like that? Uh, and then that typically, again, speeches, once the formalities were done, and food, all right? So again, food is a big thing. Um, 1887 right out the gate so two months after the founding of the post the first post member passes away at the age of 45. all right and this is uh peter walsh this is actually his grave in irondale cemetery here's his obituary um kind of a sad story here uh so doesn't look like he ever got married had a family of his own after the war um he pops up on the 1880 1890 census is uh working for local as a farm hand on local farms in the community um so what his story there you know there's obviously a story there to some extent um but what exactly that was i haven't been able to uncover but he's actually the very first uh mustered out as the terminology went during the day uh of the millerton gar post so december as i previously mentioned the was post elections so the slate of officers would be voted on, hip, hip, hurrah, we'd have our vote. But then immediately followed the annual Christmas party. And the Women's Relief Corps, actually reading the newspapers from the time at times can be kind of hysterical in how the, it's not what you typically read in a newspaper today, okay? Um, they would refer to the GAR guys as the boys, okay? Um, and apparently it didn't matter, even though this happened every year, they were always surprised when Santa showed up at the meeting and they were always surprised when they all got presents and they were always surprised at the exquisite banquet that was thrown for them by the ladies. Uh, and they were surprised every year, apparently. So, I mean, so when you're reading through these newspapers, it's actually kind of hysterical. Um, but then also, and this was another thing uh, that the GAR was uh, very big on, and the Women's Relief Corps supported big uh, heavily. The reason today why you have flagpoles in front of your government buildings, your town halls, your village halls, your schools, your county offices, your state offices, is because of the GAR. So after the Civil War, they were really big on instilling a sense of patriotism within the local communities, but also nationally, uh, and wanted to make sure that the patriot, you know, that what they fought for wasn't lost subsequently in the future. So they were very big on the flag. Now it makes sense when you think about it. What was the two things that they carried into battle? The national colors and the regimental colors, sometimes the state colors, okay, depending on where they were from. 
That's what the unit fought around. That was your rally point in the middle of chaos and hell on earth. Okay, so it becomes a very natural outcrop of that, that this is the symbol of what unifies us. So not only do they get it in front of the schools on that big flagpole, but they also make sure it gets prominently hung in every classroom in the United States. They become the force to drive that. The Women's Relief Corps, their piece of this pie was that they paid for the flag that went to the school and they would make sure it was replaced every year. So this 1913 article notes that, you know, on this nice 45 foot flagstaff was hanging a very prominent 12 by six flag right in front of the school. That's what they paid for. They would give it to the post commander and the post commander uh, during a school assembly. Now, back in those days, you didn't have that wonderful Christmas break that we now have today, okay? There was no winter recess. You went back to school the next day after Christmas. Uh, so it was typically right in that, that period between Christmas and New Year's that there would be this big school assembly. The GAR guys would come in. They would present the school principal their replacement flag for the year, and they would have a little bit of a patriotic hoorah, rah, rah, and, you know, then would move back on to their school day, okay? But this was a huge event here in the community and, and actually across the nation. So as I mentioned earlier, the whole mustering out, um, you see this start picking up in the 1910s uh, as, as these guys start passing on. Um, so here we have Charles E. French. He, uh, he passes, he, he enlisted in 1862 into Company D of the 150th, so the, the, the unit that was made up predominantly of the soldiers of the men from Northeast. Um, and it talks about his funeral and so on and so forth. Here over here, we have Seneca Marks. He was a veteran of the 128th New York Volunteers. He dies in Irondale from typhoid fever at the age of 60. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, here's that line that pops up over and over again. He leaves a wife and several small children in destitute circumstances. Um, again, we're tying in, what is all that money going to? It's going to help these widows and these orphans uh, after you know, the head of household has passed on. So we get to the 1920s. Um, here you see that exponential curve running in reverse. So by the end of 1923, we only have six members of the post left. Now you gotta keep in mind, most of these guys are pushing 80, 90 years old at this point. Only two, according to this letter, and this letter is in the state archives, um, that was sent from the post commander to the department commander, uh, that they could only have two that could make the meetings. Now what they, what the co post commander in his reply to the post, which is also in the state archives, notes that, hey, listen, uh, We've dropped the quorum requirements to have a meeting to three. Okay, that's all you need to do conduct official business of the post. Um, but it, it's, it's becoming quite clear because he's talking to them about surrendering their charter. Okay. Um, ultimately, they don't do that, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but over the course of the next 10 years, they all pass away with the last one passing away in 1933. 1924, 18 years to the day that the WRC was established here in Millerton, they surrendered their charter and they disbanded. So they had uh, eight members who took an honorable discharge from the organization, and they had another seven who end up transferring to other posts, mostly the WRC affiliated with the, the Poughkeepsie Post at that point. And they hang on for a little while longer. So, the legacy. The part where I alluded to in the beginning that we're standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. What are some of these traditions that carry on? Well, first off, the New Year's Ball. What's kind of funny here is a few years ago when we were fixing some things up in the post, we actually came across this beautiful flyer like this that actually advertises for one of these events that the Post held. Uh, and actually, if you look at some of the, uh, the Millerton News articles uh, from the 1950s and 60s, 
Uh, you can actually, they got photos in there of these New Year's ball dances type events that the Post used to have back in the day. Of course, the main component here is the Memorial Day program. If you actually look at the, the original program from the GAR, compare that to the early days of the Legion, compare that to what we do today, yes, there are differences, but the general gist of the program is very much intact. Uh, and I thought that was kind of a cool legacy that, you know, here we are more than 100 years removed from these guys um, and we're still carrying on, or about 100 years removed from these guys and we're still carrying on that tradition. Um, what's interesting here is that the GAR will still make sure Memorial Day happens right through 1927. So 1927 becomes the last year that the GAR runs the Memorial Day program. September of 1927 is when the Legion Post is established, and it's literally passing the baton from one generation of veterans to another, which I think is actually pretty cool. That's a pretty cool legacy I think we have here. Uh, not sure how many other communities locally can say that, but we can, okay? Um, what else do they pass on? They pass on all their records, their chart. One of the relics that gets passed on is this portrait of Henry Gridley that his mother in 1889 gives to the Post. She also gives them their American flag. That, from what I understand, also gets passed on uh, to the Post. Now, the source for that little gem of information actually comes from a militant memories uh, column that used to exist in the papers uh, that was written in the early 1960s. I want to say 1962, but don't quote me on that. And they, you know, so all these things are passed on. The Memorial Sunday program, that's another legacy that the Legion continues for many decades uh, after this. Um, the graves registration, that's another gem that comes out of one of those Millerton Memories columns uh, where they actually list all the guys uh, from the Legion, rec uh, from the GAR records that they still had access to at that point of what their graves registration looked like in 1927 when they hand that off to the Legion. Uh, of course, you know, the other cool legacies that we've had a continuous veterans organization presence here in Millerton since 1887. Um, unfortunately, now I can't prove this conclusively, but I think this is a reasonable hypothesis is that unfortunately the original Legion Hall burned in the early 1960s. I suspect that all these records, all the meeting minutes, all the financials, all those cool little stories from the GAR post to include that portrait of Henry Gridley and everything else was lost in that fire. That's my suspicion. I, I don't have anything to pinpoint that for sure, but that's my hypothesis. What's also interesting is the post charter is never surrendered. So in the state archives, when I was up there in 2009, when I was in the opening years of my research on this, I'm going through all these folios in the state archives, looking, looking through these records, and folder after folder actually has the original charter from all these posts throughout New York State. As they were surrendered, they were surrendered to the department. Once the Department of New York of the GAR folds, they surrender their entire archives to the state. And so that becomes the repository for their history. Millerton's is not in there. In fact, the Millerton folder has only got a couple documents in it. There's not much in it. And so my thesis is that the post finally folds when the last member, which is Ward Van de, Bog Van de Bogart, who is also buried in Irondale, passes away on February 8th, 1933. So, final thoughts. Got to tell this story. This is, of course, the picture I had at the start of this presentation. There's a reason why I have it in here. This is probably by far the coolest story, well, at least from a military history geek, this is cool, uh, that comes out of the Battle of Gettysburg. All right? So, Prior to 1993, when the movie Gettysburg becomes famous and everybody starts quoting it, at least in Civil War circles, prior to that, this, there's a monument, and I'll have a picture of that here shortly, of the 1st Minnesota Volunteer Infantry. Now, why is the 1st Minnesota Volunteer Infantry important? They are the first 
regiment mustered directly into federal service following Lincoln's call up of the militia. Now, I have to explain this here real quick. The militia is your state army, okay? At least in the context of what we're talking about in the Civil War. Lincoln calls up for 75,000 state militia. Why? Essentially to secure the, secure the capital, okay? Um, he has allocations that go out to all the states. This is what ultimately forces the Upper South to finally secede. So your states like North Carolina, Virginia, so on and so forth. The governor of Minnesota, just by happenstance, happens to be in Washington, D.C. when Lincoln issues this proclamation. He takes a walk over to the White House and promises him a thousand troops directly mustered into federal service. What's cool about these guys, now two weeks later, Lincoln starts calling for volunteers to be mustered directly from this, recruited by the states, mustered directly into federal service. Now this becomes what we know as the volunteer army, okay? So you've got essentially three forces here. You've got the state militias, you've got the volunteer army, which becomes the vast majority of the soldiers in the Civil War, and then you have the regular army. The regular army is only like 22,000 people, okay? It doesn't get any bigger than that for the entire war. All your soldiers who serve are this volunteer federal force that's organized by the states, mustered directly into federal service. These are the first guys. These guys don't just sign two or three year hitches, which everybody else does two weeks later, okay? These guys sign a five year hitch, okay? They're in it for the long haul, okay? Which is another reason why these guys are kind of cool. Fast forward, now they fight in like all the big Eastern battles, okay? You get to Gettysburg. On the evening of G July 2nd, now, I mentioned earlier that the 150th, about an hour or two after this, this action happens, is going forward to retrieve these cannons that General Sickles managed to lose when he took his corps way forward. Well, now there's this big gap between where Third Corps is hanging out in the breeze and where Second Corps is here up on Cemetery Ridge. And, I, and if you've been to Gettysburg, you, you kind of know the area I'm talking about. To get specifically where we're at, where I'm taking this photo from is on top of the Pennsylvania Memorial. This is this big gigantuan memorial smack dab in the middle of Cemetery Ridge. Down here is Little Round Top. Over here is Big Round Top. You've got the Turfy Farm on the other side of this wood line over there. This is the first Minnesota monument. Okay. Now, when I took this picture, I wasn't taking it for the monument. I was actually taking it for the look towards Little Round Top and Big Round Top. These guys are the only dudes there. There's another artillery, a federal artillery, battery of our federal artillery right next to them that they're there to defend. They're the only guys. There's 262 dudes. General Hancock comes over and you've got a brigade of five Confederate regiments, about 1,600 soldiers who are now advancing. They flank Third Corps' flank. They're now advancing. They're going to take this high ground position where these guys are at. General Hancock looks at him and goes like, listen, you guys are it. That's all I've got. I need to buy time. I've got reinforcements coming, but they're not going to get here fast enough. So he orders them to charge. Okay. So these guys fix bayonets, load one round into their single shot muskets, and they start advancing about three quarters of a mile out this field, going this way. They get to this, to the Willoughby Run come in contact with the Confederates, fire their volley, and basically it's hand-to-hand -hand combat from that point on. So it's a melee fight, all right? In 15 minutes, these guys take 82% casualties, okay? Two hours later, at about seven o'clock, after they've managed to withdraw. Now they actually successfully prevent the Confederates from advancing any further. They literally stun these guys so much, they just can't believe it, that they end up falling back. Uh, about halfway through this 15 minute fight, the 125th New York actually comes up. Now that's a regiment that comes primarily out of Rensselaer County. They come up, they support the, the 1st Minnesota, and basically the Confederates fall back. So they, they do what General Hancock needs them to do. 
These guys fall back 47 reports for the muster roll two hours later. Okay. Now, I think this story in and of itself of the first Minnesota, I think in ties in very, very well to express the passion that these veterans had for the flag and for the significance and the importance of the national colors. Because prior to the Civil War, people identified by their states. What was your country? Your country was New York. Your country was Virginia. Your country was Illinois. We didn't think ourselves as Americans. It's this conflict that brings all these people together on both sides that starts forging this, I'm no longer a New Yorker, I'm an American. Now that's a process that starts in the revolution, but it really gets cemented as a result of this conflict that rips this country apart for four years in the 1860s. And to me, this story really emphasizes the point. How far were these guys willing to go? Because when you read the personal letters of the guys out of the first Minnesota, and they're recounting this particular action, okay, they all write, none of us expected to survive. All of us expected to die. But yet they still went forward. So I think it's, it's, it behooves us today to remember how far these guys were willing to go. And that also speaks to the guys of the 150th and the guys from Millerton who served in a plethora of units throughout that terrible conflict and just how far they were willing to go to not only defend this country, but to defend that flag and what it means to those who have worn the uniform. And, uh, and I think that's something that we lose today. Unfortunately, I don't think that same sense of devotion and patriotism exists today. All right. And I think we need to do a better job as a country doing that. So on that note, what are your questions? If there are any. Ed, you first know one. How many people from North East served in the Civil War? All right. Fun question, fun answer. So one of the other little side projects that I've been working on for about a decade, excuse me, I really needed that, is one of the things that we don't have here in Millerton, and I've also realized we don't have in Pine Plains, is a roll of honor of our Civil War veterans. Okay, we're actually one of the few communities in the immediate area that actually don't have that. So what I've been able to uncover uh, pretty significantly from 1862 forward is I've got about a hundred and call it 25 names. Um, there were actually guys who were actually drafted in the 1864 draft from, from the town of Northeast. Uh, actually a significant number of those draftees actually were drafted into the Navy. Now where they ended up, I haven't been able to figure that part out, but they were there. Um, most of the guys who served went in in 1862 that I've been able to uncover. Now, there are guys who went in in 1861, but when they went in, they, didn't, I, they weren't uh, enrolled as being from Northeast. They were enrolled from where they went. So your primary recruiting centers in 1861 were New York City, Albany, Troy, okay? So you have this gap so the guys who were really passionate and all hoorah-rah in the, in the opening months of the war, that's where they traveled to. Now, I know they exist because there's other records that have kind of teased me and that, okay, this guy shows up on the 1860 census, uh, in, and, or better yet, the real gem for figuring that little gem out was the 1865 New York State census because in that census, we actually catalog, hey, this family member served. And then now all I got to do is backtrace the name and I find them on the muster roll of the associated unit that was mustered in 1861. So, so that's, what I'm, that's what I've teased out so far, but I'm nowhere near complete, I think, on how many actually ultimately served. But 
we're at least in the triple digits. Where we're going to finally end up, I'm not exactly sure. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. So moved. All right, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, there's refreshments there. Please help yourselves. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for coming.